Amen. If you have uh, your copy of the scripture, I invite you to open it up to Mark's gospel. And we're going to uh, study 20 verses today. Are you up for that? Yes. 20 verses. We're just going to kind of work our way through these 20 verses. And we're going to kind of under this umbrella of us being story people and the power of stories, especially as we're in this Easter stretch where there is an openness. We all know this around us in your workplaces, uh, in the carpool line, in, in your gym. There is an openness to the gospel that is a little bit uniquely different than the rest of the year. And I'm praying that God would send us out into that space with the stories of the gospel alive in us. And I'm praying the gospel is going to take a lot of new ground in the city of Atlanta over these next few weeks. Amen to that? So let's look at these first 20 verses of Mark chapter 5. We're going to read all of it, then we'll go back and kind of work our way through. Beginning in verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones." And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. And the herdsmen fled. I bet they did. And told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. Jesus, thank you for your word. God, I pray in just these few minutes that we have, would you help us to see what it is that you want us to see in this text so that our faith can be strengthened, so that our eyes can be opened, and so that our lives can be aligned with who you want us to be. So come and speak now, Jesus. Nobody needs to hear anything from me, but we all desperately need to hear from you today. So would you come and would you meet with us? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, when we look in the first uh, couple of verses here, uh, we get the introduction to this man. Now, it's important for you to know where in the context this story happens. It happens immediately following uh, Jesus being on the sea, the raging sea, and the calming of the seas is what happens right before here. So they get into the boat, and, and they head to shore. Uh, and th this is what's happening right before uh, and, and that section ends with the disciples after Jesus says to the storm, quit it, and it stops. The disciples go, whoa, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? So they make it through the storm, and they come to the southeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, the region of the Decapolis, a predominantly Gentile region. And I, I was trying to think of what this would be like. 
You know, like, I don't know if anybody's ever been caught in a storm, like, out on the sea. I never have been. You know, I grew up on Lake Lanier, um, and when it started raining, we just had a weather app, so we didn't go on the lake, you know? So it never really happened to me. Um, but I was thinking about a time, times in my life where just this pure, utter chaos, which is what's happening in these verses, is going on. And I was thinking, like, imagine if you were on a flight, okay? Imagine you're on a flight. Anybody ever been on a flight that didn't go so well? You wanted to just ask the pilot, like, how, how did you get your license, you know? Imagine you're on a flight, and you, you hit some turbulence. And it's okay at first, you know, the first couple, there's always, like, the people that have never flown are freaking out, but most of the people are okay. And then it gets a little worse, and it gets a little worse, and it gets a little worse, and now even the people that fly all the time are getting pretty nervous, and you look at the flight attendant, and they're trying to hold it together, because they know if they don't hold it together, you're not going to hold it together, but they're not doing a good job holding it together, and you're like, I don't know if I can hold it together. You been on that flight before? Okay, imagine that. And you're just like, you know the thing where it kind of drops and your stomach goes up? Anybody know what I'm talking about? We're on a flight like this. And you finally land, and you're like, thank you, there is a God in heaven. I landed, okay? So, so this kind of like some of what it would feel like to, to get to the shore. Like, I can't believe we just survived that storm. That was nuts. That was crazy. And then they get on the shore, and it's like, imagine you get off that flight, you're like, man, I can't wait to call my spouse and tell them that I'm, that, about this flight and how crazy it was, and I got to post about this thing, and I got to tag Delta and the pilot, and I got to do the whole thing. And imagine you come off of the jetway, and you get out into the little open thing, and then there is a crazy, demon-possessed, naked man running at you. That's what's happening right here in this text, pure and utter chaos. We're introduced to this man, and we're find, we find out that he came from the tombs, that he has an unclean spirit, an impure spirit, that he's defiled, he's dirty, right? Nothing to do with his hygiene, although he probably was lacking there in some ways as well, but he's ceremonially unclean. He's impure. He's unable to relate to God because of his moral impurity. There's a lot of uncleanness in these 20 verses. The man is defiled. He's living among the tombs, which, which are unclean. You got pigs in the story, and pigs are unclean. But this is this man's reality. So our introduction to him is Jesus comes, gets the boat to the shore. He's stepping off. This man runs at him, and we know that he has an unclean spirit. And then Mark proceeds to give us the description of the man beginning in verse chapter 3. It says that he didn't just happen to be near the tombs but that he lived among the tombs and that no one could bind him anymore, even with a chain, that at one point it was possible for him to be bound, but it's not possible anymore, that this man is in a purely hopeless situation, far beyond the point of being able to be helped by neighbors or friends, right? At one point, they could contain him. They would chain him and bind him, honestly, as a way to protect themselves from his anger and rage, but not anymore. He's too strong now. He's unable to be bound, and so in utter despair and in pure hopelessness, he lives among the tombs as though he's one of them. He lives among the dead, and in a lot of ways, he is one of the dead. And it wasn't just that this impure spirit was tormenting him. He was tormenting himself. It says that all day and all night he cried out and he was cutting himself with the stones. And this is how the enemy works. The enemy's job is to accuse you. The enemy's job is to blame you, to accuse you, and to condemn you. So it's not just that the spirit was tormenting him. The spirit was tormenting him so much on the inside that now he's tormenting himself. He's crying out all night, shouts of agony, shouts of despair, shouts of hopelessness that ultimately lead to self-destruction. And sometimes when we read the Bible, we read it as though it's this far off, you know, distant land that we can't relate to it. And Maybe some of you in the room, you're like, I don't, that, that feels like really far off distance, you know, like we got a hopeless man, we got demons and pigs, and I don't really know how to relate to all that, but I would guess there's others in this room that you're like, I, I can kind of relate to that condition. Like, I, I, I know what it's like to be in that place where you kind of feel like you're living among the dead, and you're totally hopeless, and you have nothing to look forward to, no, no possibility of restoration in your sight. You're totally isolated, and honestly, you're just at the brink of self-destruction. And for me, I, I'm, I'm going like, well, in 2007, I, knew, I, I know exactly what that was like. There were no pigs around. Well, maybe there was. I was in Dahlonega, Georgia, so maybe there were some pigs, but 
there was none of that, but I certainly knew what it meant to be weighed down by my uncleanness, to have the weight of sin pressing down on me and to have an enemy that was accusing me and condemning me and throwing darts of guilt and shame. And there was nothing that could bind me on planet earth except the heavy duty chains of guilt and shame. That's what the enemy does. That's what it says in 1 Peter 5.8. It says that we should be watchful, why? Because your adversary, the enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And maybe for you, you're like, man, that, that, that condition of this guy feels pretty distant. But honestly, for all of us, there's, there's really only two positions you can be. We can either be in Christ or we're not in Christ. We just talked about that in Romans chapter 8. And in Paul, in what I would argue is the clearest 10 verses on the explanation of the gospel, describes our position if we're not in Christ, and it's eerily similar to the position of this man. He says in Ephesians chapter 2, the first few verses, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You were dead. Seems similar to a man living among the tombs. Following the course of this world, you're being ruled by the, the forces of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, being ruled by a spirit, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom all once we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were, the, we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So before we distance ourselves too much from this man that's living on the shore, I think we should see that our condition outside of Christ is pretty similar to this man. And then in verse 6, the story takes a big turn. And it says that when he saw Jesus from a long way off, he ran and he fell down. He's crying out with a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For Jesus had already said to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what's your name? And he replies, legion, for we are many. So this man sees Jesus from afar and he runs toward him. Like he's, at, he's running at him, rushing at him to challenge him. But instead of challenging him, he collapses to him and bows down to him in pure submission to him. It's powerful that the demon realizes there ain't no competition to be had here. This is the son of the most high God. So let that encourage you today, wherever you are and whatever you're up against in life. What intimidates you does not intimidate our king. What torments you will not torment our king. What keeps you up at night will not keep our king up at night. Nothing that, that torments and terrorizes you is Jesus afraid of. In fact, all of those things look at Jesus and they go, there's no competition here. I need to bow. And it's interesting that he says, I adjure you to torment me. Like literally, if you pick that apart, it's like he swears by God, which is interesting and ironic. Like he swears by God to God, which is kind of interesting. And then Jesus asks him, what's your name? And he goes, Legion, for we are many. So he replies and he goes, we're not just one, we're many. Now, now, Legion is interesting because it's a, it's a Roman military unit that's made up of 5,800 troops. So when Jesus asks this man his name, it's not because Jesus doesn't know the man's name, by the way. It's not like Jesus forgot. Jesus is Jesus. He knows everything. So he's not asking so that the man will inform him of his name. But when the, when the demon says, we are Legion for we are many, it's elevating the significance and the utter despair of this man and ultimately highlights the incredible restoration and healing that Jesus gives to this man. And so he says, we're Legion. It doesn't mean that this man had 5,800 demons, but it does mean that there was a lot of them. There was a host of them. And yet when he sees Jesus, he has full recognition I am totally outmatched, no comparison, no competition here, and he begs Jesus. I love that. He begs Jesus. You'll notice that there's a lot of begging that happens in these 20 verses. And what torments and terrorizes us has to beg Jesus for permission to do any and everything. This is the kind of power and authority that our king has. And so they ask not to leave the region and to go into the pigs, which is weird. And they go into the pigs, and the pigs run off this hill, and they run down into the uh, Sea of Galilee, and they drown. Now, one of the things, there's, you could peel that apart. We could do an eight-week series on that. It'd be incredible. I'd be here for it. But uh, I think at the surface level, one of the things is it's highlighting what the forces of evil exist to do. It exists to demolish and to destroy God's creation. And so if I can't stay in the man, put me in the pigs. At least I can destroy them. 
And as soon as it go, the, the demons go into the pigs, the pigs run to their death. That's what they exist to do. That, that's what John 10.10 10 says. This, the thief comes to do a couple of things, to steal and to kill and to what? And to destroy. But that's not the end of John 10.10 10, because it says, but I have come that, the, that you may have life and that you may have it to the full. It's important for us to realize that we are living in a spiritual battle. And we must live in light of that. Like Paul writes about this in Ephesians chapter six. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. This was Mike Turner's like life verse. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand firm. It's important that we know today that we're in a battleground. You are, and I am, that we have an enemy. And we tend to live like in two extremes. One extreme over here is to pretend that nothing in the spiritual world exists. And we just sing our worship songs as though there's no fight going on in, in, among us. Which I think is not a very helpful position to take. Or we go to this extreme and we just live totally paralyzed by fear of what's going on. And neither of them, I think, are very helpful to take. We can't be biblically informed people and pretend that evil doesn't exist because the Bible tells us in the New Testament over and over again, we're in a battle, right? But we also don't have to live in fear of it because also as biblically informed people, we know that in the end we win. That as my seminary professor used to describe it, that we have won, but we're still behind enemy lines. And Paul writes in Colossians and he says this, and you who were dead in your transgressions and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Someone should say amen there. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Look at verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. We win. We win. We're in a battle, but we win. So we can't live in either of the two extremes. And then this is really what, where I wanted us to get today in verse 14 is the response, right? It says in verse 14 that the herdsmen fled. Now, 2,000 pigs, that really hit me when I was studying for this today. That's a lot of pigs. I don't know if you've ever seen 2,000 pigs. 2,000 pigs. And there's herdsmen there. Their job is to take care of the pigs. And they lose all the pigs. And they got to go tell the owners, we lost your pigs. Now, I can remember when I was a little boy, me and my brothers, we had a business where we would uh, watch people's pets for them. It's highly lucrative, by the way, just if you're looking for a job. People pay a lot of money for their pets. So, so we were watching our, neighbor, our neighbor's pets, and they had a dog, and they had a couple cats, and we charged extra for the cats. And, and then they got this bird, right? And the bird's name was Birdie, very original, very original, I know. And it was one of the, I don't know, remember what you call them, but it was one of the birds that could, you could teach it to say stuff and it'd talk back to you. And my brothers and I, when we were watching them, we'd had so much fun with this bird. And, you know, it'd come rest on your little finger, and it was awesome. Well, when we were taking the trash out, which was part of our agreement, the, my oldest brother was taking the trash out, hits the button in the garage, the garage door goes up, he's taking the trash out to the thing, we're playing with Birdie in the kitchen, Birdie senses air and just takes off. I didn't even know the bird could fly. Just takes off. <laughs> I mean, through the house, around the corner, out of the door, going towards the garage, right under the garage door, and he's outside. And I mean, my, we're freaking out, as you can imagine. We're going from tree to tree, like, Are you, you got him, you got him, you got him, you got him, you got him. And after, a month, after enough time, we're like, nobody's got him. This is a problem if your whole job is to watch your pets. <laughs> right? So we did what you would do. We went to the pet store with a photo of a bird that looked like Birdie, and we just bought another one and put him in a cage. Taught him how to teach him, you know, all the say, say all the same words. But imagine, they, they were watching 2,000 pigs. And it says that they fled. Of course they did. And they go into the town. They found out, by the way, if you're wondering how the story resolved. Uh, we didn't trick them for long. It'd be like you watching somebody's kid and just putting a different kid in the room when they got home. Like, it didn't last too long. And we got grounded for a long time. So that's how that uh, story resolved. But the herdsmen run off. 
They run to town, they tell the owners and the rest of the people what happened. When the people come, they're met with this shocking sight, right? They come and they're, they're shocked because one, all the pigs are gone, but two, here's this man. This, as it refers to him twice in these verses, the demon-possessed man, here he is, and he's sitting down. He never sat down. He couldn't sit still. He was being tormented. He was tearing his clothes off all day and night. He just roamed around crying out and cutting himself, and now that man is sitting down. This is the man that in verse 4 says, no one was strong enough to subdue him. Nobody. And all of a sudden, now here comes Jesus, and he seems pretty subdued to me. He's sitting down. Because Jesus has more authority and more power than anything on planet Earth. No, ch- no chains could hold him or contain him, but one, one encounter with Jesus, and he's just sitting there. Says that he's clothed. Which, I'm, if you're the disciples, you're like, praise God for that. <laughs> he's in his right mind, it says. Which would have been pretty crazy if you're a person that lives in the town. And you're just hearing this guy from over there cry out all day and night. And all of a sudden, here you come up to see him. You're like, where are all the pigs? What, is that the guy? Is that him? He's sitting down. He's got clothes on. And he's in his right mind. And I, I don't know where everybody is in, this, in your journey today. I don't know if, ever, if you're following Jesus or not following Jesus. I don't know if you can relate to this man or not. But I am telling you that there is a God. He's alive. His name is Jesus, and he has the power over all things. And so whatever the thing, like, you think this man ever thought he was going to be sitting down clothed and in his right mind? No chance. You think anybody in the town thought this guy would ever be sitting down clothed and in his right mind? No chance. In 2007, if you ask me, do you think that however many years later you'll be here? I mean, I was clothed at the time, so (laughs) definitely not in my right mind. I would go, no chance. But one encounter with Jesus and all things are possible. And I want you to hear that today. I don't know what's got a grip of you. I don't know what's got you chained up and shackled. But it has to bow to the power and the authority of Jesus. So we mentioned in Ephesians chapter 2. That we're all more similar to the man in this text than we'd like to admit, apart from Christ. That we too, there's only two options. We're either dead or alive spiritually. There is no neutral middle ground. It's It's not a scale. There's two options. You're dead spiritually or you're alive. And if you're dead spiritually and alive physically, you're just the walking dead. You're just living among the tombs. But Ephesians 2 doesn't end there. Pick back up in verse 4. Here's the description for verse 1 through 3, saying we're similar to this man. But look at verse 4. But God. I love that from the baptism. There's always a but God, who is being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead, living among the tombs, he now has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. This is the power of God. So all the people come out, and how do you think they would respond? They were afraid, naturally, like you would be and I would be, same way the disciples were when Jesus told the storm to stop and it stopped. They they were filled with fear. And this much power causes fear, trembling. Like this is a very common response. When When unholy people encounter a holy God, the only response in the scriptures is fear and trembling. But our fear can lead us to two options. Your fear can lead you to fall down and worship him or your fear can lead you to try to do your best to escape him. So how did the people in the town respond? You're like, surely it'd be like Luke 15, you know? Surely it's like the prodigal son coming home. Here's this guy that's been out in the tombs for who knows how long, crying out and cutting himself, and here he is. He's not bleeding. He's got clothes on. He's in his right mind. He's sitting down. He's contained. Surely his homecoming is reason to celebrate. Kill the fattened calf. It says that their response was that they begged Jesus to leave 
their region. How crazy is that? That while witnessing the supernatural power of God, their response was, please, just go. Just leave us alone. Just move on. Please don't stay here. Like, what? How could that be your response to this? How could you walk up on this and that's your response? Uh, I think there's a few reasons. One, 2,000 pigs is a lot of pork. That's big money. Significant impact on their local economy. And for them, maybe their material world was just worth so much more than the spiritual world. How foolish. And yet, how often we do the same thing. We're okay with Jesus as long as he gives us what we want, but as soon as our wants and his desires come into conflict, we say, please, just leave us alone. It was Jim Elliott that said this, and I love this quote. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. There is nothing in the material world that is not worth surrendering so that we get Jesus. There is nothing worth keeping. It's all gonna fade away. It's all gonna rust and rot. But in Jesus, there is something that lasts forever. And maybe the second reason is they walk up to this place and all the pigs are gone and here's this man and it was evident to them that this man was gonna disrupt their comfortable little lives. That with him, everything was going to change. And they didn't like that. They, they, they liked their lives the way they were. Their lives were gonna have to change if he stayed and they just simply didn't wanna change. So they begged Jesus, please just, just leave us alone and just get out of here. Just depart from the region. But look at the second response. Look at the response of the man. It says in verse 17, the townspeople are begging him, please leave us alone. But in verse 18, it says, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him. That's, that's the third time begging is mentioned. Begged him that he might be with him. And Jesus replied to him, this is crazy. Don't miss this. This is the whole point of the message today. And Jesus replied to him, he said, he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends, tell them how much the Lord's done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And the demon-possessed man and this man went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. There's two options when you encounter a holy God, when you encounter this kind of divine power. You either, in fear, fall down and worship him and say, I wanna give you everything. Or, in fear, you try your best to escape him at all costs. And this man fell down and worshiped Jesus and he said, please let me come with you, please let me come with you. And Jesus said, no, the way you're gonna follow me is not by coming with me. The way you're going to follow me is you're going to go back where you came from. And you're going to tell everybody what I've done for you. The reality is that we are God's plan A to reach a hurting and broken world. We're story people. We always have been. It's the way God created us. That you have, if you have a story of God changing your life, then God commissions us. And he goes, that's the only weapon you need? Just, just go talk about that. Right? And the enemy has got so many of us on the sidelines with fear, like, oh, what if, what if they ask a question? I don't know the answer. What if they ask me to, like, explain the Trinity? I'm like, one, I doubt they will, but two, here would be a great answer. I'm not sure. Let's find out together. Right? But the enemy's got so many of us on the sidelines. And Jesus would oftentimes go, just, just, just tell people how God's changed your life. Like that was this man's assignment and apparently from Jesus, it was enough for him. Just go home and tell people what, what happened to you. Just go home and tell the story. And the man goes to his home and he goes to the 10 cities, the Decapolis, and he's telling the story of what Jesus has done. And you see that kind of all throughout scripture in John chapter four, the woman at the well, what's her testimony? I met a man who told me everything I ever did. No theological training. Just, I met a man who told me everything I ever did. John chapter nine, the man born blind. What's his testimony? 
I didn't even know the guy's name. He just said, all I know is I used to be blind, and now I can see. And a whole city was turned upside down for the glory of God. So I ask you, has God done anything in your life? Has he replaced anger and rage with peace? Has he brought your marriage back from the brink of falling apart and he's restored it and your marriage is healthy again? Has he repaired your relationship with your kids that you thought would be severed forever and somehow in his grace he's brought you back together? Has he provided for you when you thought all oh, the ends weren't gonna meet and all of a sudden the ends didn't meet but God was in the middle of it and he brought something new to you and provided for you? Has he set you free from an addiction? Great! Then just tell people that. Just start with that and watch the story of the gospel compel people into your story, not just that they can hear your story and be led to you, but that they can hear your story and be led to the God who is ruling and reigning over your story. And the way that God, which is incredible, you know, the, the gospel was ultimately gonna reach the Gentiles and it was gonna be a message for all people, a new humanity, and what's amazing is like, this is one of the first seeds of the gospel, the story of Jesus traveling into Gentile land. And who did it come from? It came from a man that was totally hopeless in utter despair, who was raging in anger, who was, totally, who was cutting himself, purely hopeless. And he meets Jesus and he has his life changed and Jesus says, hey, uh, everybody else, you know, the, the common theme is uh, come and follow me. But Jesus said to this man, hey, you're gonna follow me but not by coming with me. You're gonna follow me by going back home. You're gonna tell everybody what I have done for you. So as we come into these next two weeks, as we come around this Easter season, as we come into Palm Sunday next Sunday, I just wanna encourage us. I don't want us to buy the lie of the enemy that you don't know enough. Has God done anything in your life? Anything. And if he has, just tell people that. Tell people at your work that. Tell people at your gym that. Share the stories of what Jesus has done and watch the power of the gospel flip your community upside down for the glory of God. So three really simple applications. We're gonna pray and we'll wrap up our time. I wanna encourage everybody here because I was even convicted of this. Like one, um, we've just moved so fast in life and we forget so much that's happened. Find a way to write down the ways that God's come through for you so that you can remember them when you're, when you're prone to forget them. Two, we oftentimes take credit for what God's actually done. So like, did you get a job? It's not because you got a great resume, okay? Unless you're the guy that went to Penn and did like nine kinds of engineering, then maybe it's because of your resume. If, if God provided a job for you, it's him. He gave it to you, he's the provider. So, so don't take credit for what he's done, but give him credit for what he's done. Write it down so that you can remember it. And I just want to encourage you to do that. Maybe it's a practical step you can take tomorrow. Just find some time in your day to get a page, to open a note on your phone or to find a sheet of paper and to write down, here are some ways that God's come through for me. And then share them. Maybe for you at first, it's like just share them with your spouse. Just, just get used to sharing your story. Just practice. How would I tell people how God's come through in this area of my life? I know it sounds so basic, but think about it. Most of us are pretty uncomfortable doing that. And think about what would happen if God unleashed a couple thousand people today from this house into the city with stories that are actually willing to tell people the stories of how God's come through for them. So write out your story and practice it. Here's number two. Ask somebody else their story. We're so disinterested in other people because we're so preoccupied with ourselves, but those are the people that we're here to be on mission to reach. <laughs> so just find a space somewhere in your day over the next week where you can ask somebody their story. And almost every time when you ask someone their story, one, you're going to learn a lot about them, which is amazing, but two, they're going to respond to you and say, well, what about you? And now you have an opportunity to share what God's done in your life. So I wanna encourage you to write out your story, to rehearse, practice how you would tell the stories, how you would recount God's grace at work in your life, to ask somebody else their story, take time to genuinely be interested in someone else, and to take up the challenge to share your story of how God's come through with you with someone in the next two weeks. And just trust God with it, and watch what God will do. As we say to God, Baby, you've done so much for me. I wanna follow you. Can I come with you? Can, can we all just come together? Can all of, us, all of us lights just come together and shine our light real bright and can we just stay together? And Jesus is going, 
you can follow me, but I want you to follow me by going back home to your friends, to your community. And I want you to tell the stories of how Jesus has had mercy on you.